You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Hey, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Tax Smart REI Podcast. Today, Ryan Carrier, Senior Advisor here at the firm, is filling in for Brandon Hall, who's out speaking at the Best Ever Conference. And we're going to be joined today by Dave Zook, also known as the Real Asset Syndicator, who is a business owner, syndicator, and tax strategist to discuss alternative tax advantage asset classes for tax smart investors. With interest rates soaring and deals becoming harder and harder to come by, it doesn't hurt to keep your mind open to other tax advantage investment opportunities, which is why we'll be discussing not only the investment merits of investing in ATM machines, but also why they're so lucrative from a tax perspective. We'll also briefly touch on other tax advantage asset classes that perform well in times like these, such as self-storage and car washes. We'll dive into all of that in just one minute after a quick word from Driftwood Capital. Driftwood Capital is a vertically integrated real estate investment firm with a focus on hospitality assets. For more than 25 years, the principals at Driftwood Capital have built deep relationships with brands, lenders, and brokers, unlocking direct access to institutional grade investments for its network of over 1,500 accredited investors. Driftwood finds deals, completes due diligence, creates the business plan, secures financing, and closes the deal with its own capital. Then Driftwood offers accredited investors the opportunity to invest directly in these deals with a minimum of $50,000, enabling you to create a diverse portfolio that meets your financial goals. It's time to start building your portfolio today. Visit www.driftwoodcapital.com slash CPA to learn more. Again, that's www.driftwoodcapital.com slash CPA to learn more. That's all for now. And without further ado, we'll jump right into today's episode. Hey, Dave, thanks for taking the time to join us on the show today. Uh, you know, you have a very interesting background, not only as a sponsor and a business owner, but you're also a tax strategist. And a lot of the investments that you sponsor are really tax free or tax efficient. And if you could give our listeners like a brief overview of your background, kind of how you got involved in this particular space, you know, real assets with tax advantage income. Yeah, so I my background is I grew up in a very business-friendly, entrepreneurial family, and we're in the modular building business. And my dad was very successful. I watched him buy assets. I watched him self-manage some single-family homes that he bought as an investment. And I just quickly made up my mind that that was never going to be me. And, And I sort of shunned real estate investing from an early age from watching that unfold. But as I was growing up, Coming out of my teens into my 20s, I started building some businesses and got myself in a tax position in my 30s where I was paying a half a million dollars a year in tax. And it, it just really, you know, some of the businesses that I built were doing really well and it's make a lot of money, but I was a tax slave. And so one of the things, a couple of things that changed my life, um, Robert Kiyosaki told me that you can make millions of dollars a year and pay no tax legally. And, and his CPA, Tom Woolwright, said, if you want to change your tax, you got to change your facts. And it was the first time in my life that I realized that it was in my control to kind of set my own destiny in that space. I always thought if you make a lot of money, you you got to pay a lot of tax. It's, you know, conventional wisdom, right? So, you know, I've got to hang around with the right folks and quickly realize that you can use real estate, specifically multifamily apartments, which is what I, was, you know, I started doing then was uh, buying apartment building that quickly went from $500,000 a year in tax to zero and been really close to zero ever since. And it's just been a lot of fun. Awesome. And I know besides multifamily, you're also involved in other tax advantage assets. Would you be able to kind of give a quick overview of like what you're currently involved in and why maybe you decided to get involved in some of those asset classes? Yeah, so our three core main asset classes are self-storage, ATMs, and car washes. And I have sold all of our multifamily apartment buildings. I had built up a portfolio of 3,000 to 4,000 doors, and I sold my last one in August of 22. And over that time, during that time, you know, from 2000, about 17 and forward, I I'd started kind of transitioning from multifamily into self-storage. Love the space. It's been very kind to us. But also, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm a serial investor. And I invest in a lot of different asset classes. But our three core asset classes we take out to investors is self-storage, ATMs, and car washes. And just Lots to love about all three of them, and sometimes for different reasons. You know, some of them are are more aggressive on the tax impact side. Some of them are more aggressive on the cash flow side. 
And then, you know, some of them, you know, may have a big equity appreciation benefit to them. So really just designing my portfolio with some diversification, getting those asset classes to work for me, keeping myself tax efficient. So those are some of the reasons that I invest in some of those asset classes. But I, you know, I love the asset classes, but even better, I love the operations teams that are behind those asset classes. Because at the end of the day, that's what makes those asset classes work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely cannot knock the operators is the backbone of any business, right? So, you know, I know ATMs are very popular amongst our community, our tax smart investors community. A lot of people um, I've seen over my career invest in ATMs because of the cash flow benefits as well as the tax benefits that come with ATMs. I know there's a lot of tax benefits there and the ability to use depreciation. But before we kind of dive into that, could you kind of give us a quick overview maybe of what the investment opportunity with ATMs are, maybe like the pros and cons, and then we can kind of get into the tax side of things? Yeah. So the investment opportunity is, I'll give sort of a back story on the ATM as an asset class. There's several different ways to make money in ATMs and the ATM business. I know some mom and pop operators who run around servicing 20, 30, 50 ATM machines and it's a very hands-on, very sensitive business, you know, lots of cash involved. So typically when you have a mom and pop operator, they're very active in the business. That can be great. That can be a very lucrative business model, but it's not scalable. You know, you get your little business going on, you really can't scale that model. And then on the flip side of that, you have big publicly traded companies, fully audited you know, everything from the maintenance contractors to the people delivering the cash, it's all, you know, cameras everywhere, fully audited. Um, we're somewhere in the middle, also audited, also using third party contractors to do the work for us. We're, you know, we, instead of going to private equity for our cash, we basically take down a large portfolio of ATM machines that are already in position, already in operation. And then we take that portfolio and we fund the portfolio with investors, with our investors' cash. So the investment opportunity for our investors is to come in and buy the units of ATM machines. We manage those ATM machines. They get a slice of the revenue coming off the surcharge transactions. And it's a passive, it's very passive for an investor. It's very lucrative from a cash flow perspective. And the tax impact is really aggressive too, 100% bonus depreciation. And it just works at a number of different levels. But uh, those are some of the highlights. It, it's really a, a very aggressive cash flow stream and a great tax play as well. That's great. How do you guys actually choose the market that you're going to invest and acquire these ATMs? So great question. This at its core is a real estate play. You're taking a two foot by two foot piece of real estate and maybe bring it as not to its highest and best use. You're monetizing that piece of real estate. So, you know, what's the three most important questions for a real estate transaction or a real estate purchase is, you know, location, location, location. There's no difference in the ATM space. It's very location sensitive. You know, you want to be where the people are that use ATMs. And, and it's a very specific group of people. I'm guessing many of your listeners don't use a lot of cash. You know, most of our peer group doesn't use cash. I don't use cash. And I'll tell you a quick story. About two weeks ago, we were in Florida and I needed some cash. Something came up. We had to pay somebody in cash. And, and I actually had to get my kids to go out to the ATM machine and get cash out because I couldn't get them out. I own hundreds of ATM machines myself. Personally, I can't get cash. I don't use much cash. But there's a... You know, there's a group of people, normally it's lower income folks, it's EBT card carriers, you know, folks on welfare that are getting their cards filled. They can run to an ATM machine and get cash. You got immigrants that are using these ATM machines a lot. That's the way they transact. That's their bank. And so you got this group of people. And when you look at that group of people, it's one of the fastest growing demographics in this country. And so when you recognize that there's more cash, not less. Many people think cash is done. There's more cash in circulation today. There's more than twice the amount of cash in circulation today than there was 12 years ago. And so when you realize that, and then you pair that up with the demographic that we serve and see that that's one of the fastest growing groups in this country, it starts to make a lot more sense. But it's not for us. This, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, 
you know, those of us who invest in, let's say, C-class multifamily apartments, we wouldn't live there, but we invest in them, right? Sort of like that in the ATM space. We're not users, but somebody's picking up that surcharge revenue and it might as well be us, right? Yeah, you actually kind of answered the question that I was most curious about with our time, which was, do you actually see this industry, the ATM industry, is as a growing industry? And it kind of sounds like you would say yes, because the demographics are growing and their use of kind of the cash from the ATM is growing. So you'd say yes, but how, how else does like, you know, Bitcoin come into this? Does Bitcoin impact the ATM business as well a lot for you guys? Yeah, so it is a growing space. And in terms of Bitcoin, one of the things that we got a little calloused about is, you know, you, you read the articles, you read the articles about the death of cash or CBDC or Bitcoin or new technologies coming out that's going to replace cash. We're a little bit callous to that just simply because you can dig up Wall Street Journal articles that talk about cash going away in two or three years. And that's back in the early 90s. Well, there's more cash in circulation today than there was then. So we've seen cash, we've seen the use of cash grow right alongside of Apple Pay, Google Wallet, Cash App, Venmo, crypto, you name it, all kinds of new technologies that's coming out that, that has to do with you know different payment methods. But we've seen the use of cash grow right alongside of those. Yeah. So you know, speaking of cash, you know, I know that specifically the ATM space or these types of investments, it's more of a cash flow play, like you kind of mentioned earlier. It's not like a typical, you know, say, real estate value add deal, maybe a multifamily deal where, you know, someone comes in, renovates the property, pushes the value of the property up, and then at the end you sell and there's a big payout. And this is, from my understanding, a much more, you know, you're, you're receiving cash throughout the deal. Could you kind of maybe go into a little bit about how that actually benefits investors and like what someone could expect if they're investing in this space versus say someone who is more accustomed to that value add type of investment? Sure. So, you know, some investors take issue with that, that, you know, you get to the end of the seven year deal, you don't get your capital back. You don't have an asset that you can sell and make a profit on. There's some, you know, distinct advantages. And I'll go through them. One is the cash on cash return on this asset is it's around 25% annualized. But here's a little catch. When you consider the loss of value of your equipment over a seven-year contract period, which is the length of time this deal is alive, it's a seven-year contract period, so you're getting monthly cash flow for seven years. And so to really to compare this to another asset class, you got to go by IRR. And so we got IRRs around 19%. And so when you look at, let's say, an apartment building, that you said to your investors, look, we're going to buy this apartment building. We're going to sell it in seven years. IRR is going to be between 19 and 20%. Would that be a great deal? Okay, if the answer is yes, then you should be okay with an ATM investment, even though you don't sell it for profit at the end. One of the beautiful things about this, and we talked about tax play, you know, tax impact early in our conversation, you know, when you consider that you get Today, it's now 80% bonus depreciation. You know, last year, it was 100% bonus depreciation. But even with 80% bonus depreciation, and then you add in that first 12 months of cash flow, you're getting between 60 and 70% of your principal back in your pocket in that first year. In that first year from your time your cash flow starts, now you're taking a lot of risk off the table. You're taking your risk capital off the table, and it's back in your pocket. Now you've got another six years worth of aggressive cash flow behind that. So when you consider the tax impact and how quickly you get your cash back, you're not unlike an apartment building where you may be getting steady cash flow throughout the hold. And then your, your real upside is when you sell, you're getting your cash flow, aggressive cash flow throughout the whole period, throughout the seven years. So there's some very distinct differences between uh, brick and mortar. Uh, real estate investment and this asset class. But when you start getting ad advanced and start using this asset class that has aggressive depreciation and start using it to offset the tax liability and some of your other investments or assets that you're using to build wealth or, or accumulating, you get yourself in a tax-free or tax-efficient situation, that's a great way to, to build wealth. You get momentum very quickly. Can you sell these ATMs for some sort of like a salvage value amount? Or are they basically like, no, it's, there's no value at the end of that seven years? 
Yes, you can. And and I'm happy to send our investment summary. All that information is in there. But the answer to your question is yes. We at you know at the end of seven years, we sell your ATMs at fair market value, which is you know almost nothing. We project around three thousand dollars. But it's yes, you do get some money back at the end of the deal when we sell your units for basically scrap value. That's very interesting because a lot of a lot of our people within our community, they always get scared of the big old depreciation recapture, right? Like they're always, you know, when you sell an apartment building, you know, unless you're able to 1031 exchange it or you're able to invest in another deal, maybe like ATMs and use the losses to offset the capital gain on the sale of that investment, you know, the depreciation recapture is inevitably there. But it seems like in this investment, the depreciation recapture is minimal, if if not, you know, almost non-existent because the salvage value of the asset at the end of the term and when it's sold is almost nothing. So it's like, for example, you know, you get the, the you get the cash flow throughout the life of the investment. You're able to offset that cash flow with the depreciation that's generated from you know depreciating the ATM machines, whether that's through bonus depreciation or what have you, you're getting that benefit, but then you don't have that downside of having to worry about the depreciation recapture at the end. Yeah, the the most you know, and there's no wrong way to use the depreciation. The the most conservative way to use the depreciation is just do nothing and just let it sit there in your depreciation bucket and wipe out the tax liability and the cash flow that's coming from your investment. The most aggressive way you can use it is take all of the depreciation in year one and offset other income that you've got coming in and making that tax free as well. But just to your point about the recapture, when you collect the, let's say, $3,000 at the end of the deal, that's considered income. So there is no depreciation recapture. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's kind of a big deal. When you consider, you know, unlike an apartment building or self-storage, when you sell the asset, you then turn around and recapture all that depreciation that you took. There is no recapture here. So you really got to count your tax impact as cash in this case, because you never recapture it. It's a very interesting investment for sure. You know, it's something you know I'm definitely considering. I know you mentioned before you could offset other sources of income. A lot of people get confused in this space. At least people over our community have came to me with this question in the past, and that's ATM machines, the, the income that's being generated, the losses that are being generated, perhaps from these ATM machines, this is passive income, passive losses. All right. So, you know, you can't you know, go invest in an ATM machine and necessarily take these losses against your active income, like say a W-2 job or maybe an active trader business. However, these losses can offset other forms of passive income, like your real estate investments, like other ATM machines, perhaps like other passive investments. Is that correct in your experience? Yeah, so you can't take this depreciation to offset tax liability on W-2 income, ordinary income. This is a passive investment. It produces passive losses. So again, you know, if you don't have other passive income to offset, then you just let this set here in your passive income bucket or your passive depreciation bucket, and it wipes out the tax liability on the income coming from your ATM investment. But if you have other income, other passive income from other assets that are coming in that aren't protected, you can use that depreciation to wipe out the tax liability on those other income streams as well. That's powerful. That's powerful. And it's an important distinction for everybody out there to understand. You know, if you're looking to offset your W-2 tax liability, passive investment like an ATM machine wouldn't be that way. I just want to clarify that because we get this question all the time. Some people think they're going to go invest in an ATM machine, start wiping out their W-2 tax liability. But you know, while that's not possible, you could see here from what we're discussing today, ATM is very efficient from a tax perspective because again, it would shelter that income from the ATM machines throughout the life of the deal. And then also with the salvage value being so low at the end, you know, the depreciated recapture is virtually non-existent or at least you know, a very minor concern there. So very well, I think it, I think it's very important. Like when you're, I'm guessing most of the people that are listening to this are interested in building wealth, right? And right. so I think it's hard to build wealth when you don't have your tax thing figured out. If you can figure out how to be tax efficient and start using depreciation to offset the tax liability on your on your income, that's one of the quickest ways to get momentum to build wealth. If you're not paying attention and you're just out there making a lot of money you're going to get taxed and you know you're going to be the tax slave that i used to be and so when you can figure out how to get that under control and and live a tax efficient life using some of these asset classes that we're talking about atm specifically right now you can get momentum quickly and your path to building wealth becomes a lot easier and just to pile on to that we talk a lot about real estate professional status the short-term rental tax strategy pulling rental properties that by default are passive 
and then using those strategies to make those losses non-passive. For people who can't meet real estate professional status or their short-term rental strategy, but have passive losses, that then can be offset by this you know, theoretical passive income that's coming in from year two, three, four, five, six, seven from the ATMs. That can basically offset one another because they're both passive. So this is actually really significant for those listeners who are like, oh man, I wish I could meet reps or hey, I'm not really interested in getting into short-term rentals. Hey, this is another opportunity to have kind of these passive income and passive losses offset one another. So this is really significant for our listeners, I think. Yeah. And, and you know, again, just the importance of realizing that this is depreciation that you can use to offset your tax liability on other income and you never have to recapture that like you would when you're selling a, a, a building, a self-storage asset or an apartment asset. Yeah, shifting gears a little bit away from the ATM space. ATMs are certainly great investment opportunity. I know you also have another investment opportunity that you invest in. We actually did an episode, Brandon and I did an episode on car washes a few episodes back and how if you are an operator of car washes, there are ways that you can use car washes to offset your income, your non-passive income. But just going down the car wash space a little bit, would you be able to just discuss a little bit about why car washes, why you decided to go into the car wash space and kind of what the investment opportunity and you know tax benefits for investing in a car wash you know type of deal are? Well, I'm an investor and the asset classes that I offer to my investors, I mean, it's, a, it's simply a reflection of my portfolio. I find an asset class that I like. I find an operations team that I love. We go out and create value in some sort of way, whether it's ATMs and putting them in, in location, monetizing it, that location. You know, car washer, we're building a lot of Tommy's Express car washes. We're set to be very shortly the, the second largest franchisee in Tommy's Express entire organization. And so I just came back this morning from an investment conference in Salt Lake City. Two different ones, actually. I was there. I, I got to speak at, at this investment conference. and. And it was sort of heavy multifamily. And so there's a lot of frustration in the room. You know, there's, and there's some people that were in trouble that, you know, when, when interest rates go from three and a half to six, I mean, that, that's a problem if you're not covered, if you're not protected. And so, you know, your question is why car washes? Well, I chuckle sometimes when I hear people talking about this apartment deal that they're working on and and now it doesn't make sense anymore because there's a 75 basis points rate hike or 50 basis point you know a half a percent and now the deal doesn't work anymore i need more margin than that and i'll give you an example like when we went through the spring and summer of 2020 covid-19 i mean we're like it's raging and people are scared and so our portfolio our surcharge transactions fell at one point where our revenue fell at one point between nine and 10%. We've got a 28% buffer, meaning the decline in transaction volume could be 28%, could drop 28% before our investors would have any kind of negative impact. Our car wash facilities that are operational, we're talking 45 to 50% margins. So when you're talking about interest rates or the cost of capital, the cost of capital could go up by 10 to 15 percent and these deals would still work. There's a lot of margin in there. So why car washes? Lots of reasons why I love this space right now, but margin, cash flow, tax impact. And here's something else many people don't realize. Car washes and gas stations are the only brick and mortar commercial real estate asset classes that the building is considered like a piece of equipment. Like you, you can write off the, or you can deduct the cost of the building just like as it was a piece of equipment. So if you got 100% bonus depreciation, you can take 100% bonus depreciation on that building, just like you could if it was you know, a piece of equipment inside the building. So it's very unique in that gas stations, car washes, the only ones in the business where, you know, you don't have to do a cost save study. You don't have to accelerate the depreciation. You've got to automatically take 100% bonus depreciation on that building. And so tax impact, cash flow, there's a lot to love about the subscription model where you have monthly memberships that helps reduce the volatility, helps reduce the risk for investors. It also builds incredible value when you can show a consistent stream of income through subscriptions to private equity firms and institutions. 
that's probably what will be our exit will be to a big institutional private equity firm. And that's how they value some of these assets is when you have that recurring revenue subscription based model. And so I could keep going on and on about why I love car wash space, but that those are some of them. You know, it's very interesting that you said that because I see a lot of people, you know, a lot of sponsors right now hurting in the multifamily space because exactly what you said, you know, interest rates went up quite substantially, quite quickly. And a lot of deals are no longer making sense for them. They're slowing down a uh, deal flow. Uh, they're not putting in as many offers before returns are, of course, taking a hit. And I-, I think sometimes people, especially in the real estate space, get too focused on real estate, right? And they forget that there's other asset classes out there like ATM machines or like car washes, for example, that you can get greater returns. And like you said, with, with greater margins, there's more insulation, I guess, what is what I'm trying to say from the impact of interest rates. So I guess for everybody who's listening out there, for all the tax smart investors, real estate could be the backbone, maybe of your portfolio, but you know, there's nothing wrong with taking a look at some of these other investment opportunities, especially during times like this, when interest rates are impacting your deals and acquisitions are slowing down. You know, take a look at these other asset classes, see how they can maybe boost the returns of your portfolio or maybe be a better investment than the other opportunities that are currently available you know, in the marketplace. Yeah, not only do you get more margin out of some days. You create some diversification in your portfolio. That was important to me. Uh, One of the reasons I made the transition from apartments to self-storage was in my research, I figured out that self-storage is one of the most recession resilient asset classes in any commercial real estate space. And so, you know, realizing, you know, I'm often, you know, sort of stress test different asset classes, you know, like how did this asset class do from 2008 to 2010 or 2020 to 2022, you know, what did that look like? And when you stress test a self storage against any one of those time frames, you'll see that that was one of the best performing asset classes throughout and then after, you know, like during the recovery period of any of its commercial real estate peers. So just you know, creating that diversification inside your portfolio is a big deal as well. Yes, no, diversification definitely key. And I think a lot of investors definitely do probably, you know, get stuck in that real estate bubble. So it, it's important to consider how you can diversify your asset classes. I know right now I'm speaking from my personal experience, I'm diversifying my portfolio. So I just multifamily, which is predominantly what I've been in in the past. And certainly considering some of these these alternative asset classes like ATMs, like car washes specifically, because of everything we just talked about here on this podcast. And and just for some of our listeners here, right, just to share some personal experience, you know, I'm not in the real estate professional bucket, right? I cannot turn losses from my uh, my real estate investments non-passive. I can't do that. So the play that I have available to me is how do I minimize taxes, right, on these other investments that I'm making, right? One way I minimize taxes is by putting you know, stocks and what have you in tax advantage accounts like IRAs and stuff like that. But then when you have the money outside of your retirement accounts and your you know taxable accounts, quote unquote, if you will... Um, how can you minimize taxes in those areas? And uh, one way to do that is make sure you're investing in asset classes like this that have these benefits where you can offset your passive income with passive losses and really have a tax efficient portfolio outside of that. So I know everybody in the community loves loves the ability to use short-term rentals or reps like Ryan was saying before to offset your active income, but you really got to look at it sometimes from a different angle and say, okay, how can I minimize the tax liabilities using these other investment opportunities I think we just went through a bunch of them here today that can help you do that. Yeah. And, and, you know, talking about diversification, you know, you're talking, you know, when you look at the difference between an ATM investment that has aggressive cash flow, aggressive tax impact, but no equity on the back end. We talked about that. And then you look at our self storage investment where we're a heavy value add shop. So we're, you know, you got very modest cash flow during the hold, you got a modest tax impact during the hold. But then you've got, you know, in our history, you'll see just an incredible buildup of equity appreciation and, you know, you make your money on the exit. So having those two very different things in your portfolio at the same time. And another example I'll give you is, you know, we're talking spring 2020, summer 2020 through, you know, going into 2021, eviction moratoriums and all kinds of not fun things that if you were an apartment investor going on happening during that time there was no eviction moratoriums and self-storage you know so that was a source of 
comfort and a source of stability inside the portfolio when you had those, you know, when you sort of had those two asset classes doing two different things. There was a, it was a source of stability. There was none of that going on in the self storage space. And self storage, it, it was like one of the best, again, one of the best performing asset classes right behind data centers this time. You know, yeah, you are being spied on. Don't, don't, uh, you don't need to question that. But from 2008 to 2010, self storage best performing asset class among all of its commercial real estate peers, 2020 to 2022, number two behind data centers. So really just having stability inside your portfolio in times of uncertainty. Yeah, it seems like kind of no matter what facts and circumstances and life situation you're in, there's there's some sort of a tax advantage investment that you can be making, right? We talk about wraps and short-term rentals. Hey, I'm not in that. Hey, I've got this over here as far as kind of you know, more tax advantage investments that I can make. For some of our listeners, not everyone's going to be like an accredited investor. So do you have to be an accredited investor to invest into these kind of syndications that you guys offer? You do. Um, okay. we, we only do five or six fees, which means that you need to be accredited to take part in any of these deals. Uh, I'll give a quick tip to anybody who out there who is like, oh, I wish, you know, I, you know, I don't maybe meet the income or net worth requirements uh, to become accredited. One way you could become accredited is by holding a specific license from the SEC. There's three of them, but the easiest one for most individuals to obtain is the Series 6 uh, 5. That's the, your uh, registered investment license. And uh, I actually obtained that a few years ago for this exact purpose. It's a great way to become accredited and get access to these type of 506C investments if you're not meeting those income or net worth requirements just yet. And just for anybody who's who's wondering, it's uh, $200,000 dollars. Uh, the way to qualify is either you have two hundred thousand dollars of income for the last two years with the expectation of meeting that again the third year if you're single. Uh, if you're married, it could be three hundred thousand combined between you and your spouse, or it's one million in net worth excluding your primary residence. So those that's how you become traditionally become accredited. But again, if you hold one of these licenses like this series six five, you're also going to be considered accredited as well. I mean the test I took the test relatively easy to study for and pass. So. Uh, if you're wondering out there how you can become accredited faster, that might be an option for you. And there's one more way that's new for, for the last 12 months, and that is if you're a key employee of a company that sells securities. If you're a director and officer in a company that sells securities, that's another way you can be uh, accredited. Yeah. So there's a bunch of ways out there for, for people to become accredited. And you know, Dave, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us on the show today and, and sharing your knowledge and expertise in these areas. You know, if, if our listeners wanted to learn more about you, what you have going on, maybe get involved in investing in ATMs or car washes, self-storage, what have you, what would be the best way for them to do so? Yeah, so you can go to our website at therealassetinvestor.com. The best way to reach any of us is to just go straight to info at therealassetinvestor.com. That gives you access to my entire team, and I promise you somebody will get back to you quickly. Feel free to reach out for resources on any of these asset classes, or if you have a tax question or any of that stuff, feel free to, to reach out to us. And uh, for sure, one of my team members will get back to you. Info at therealassetinvestor.com. All right. Awesome. We'll go ahead and drop that in the show notes for anybody who's interested in exploring this further. You know, thanks again, Dave. Really appreciate you coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on your show. It was fun.